May was only a few days away. And Eva Harris gazed out the hospital corridor window. Watching sparrows playfully splashing in the puddles in the yard. A cat prowled along the fence. Its intent gaze fixed on the sparrows. Ready to pounce. Eva couldn't help but notice the impending chase and opened the window. She shouted at the striped hunter to discourage it from attacking the sparrows. The sudden interruption caused a commotion. In the hospital's usually tranquil backyard. A passing nurse. Somewhat irked. Scolded Eva. Why are you making so much noise? It's a quiet hour. Don't disturb other patients who are trying to sleep. Go to your ward. Eva smiled and reached into her pocket to pull out a paper. She showed it to the nurse. Explaining. I've already been discharged. I'm waiting for my husband. I'm sorry about the noise. I won't do it again. The nurse. Now aware of the situation. Instructed Eva to go downstairs and wait for her husband in the hall. Eva followed the nurse's advice and. Soon found herself sitting in an uncomfortable chair in the hallway. Her hands gently caressing her round belly. People bustled about. Back and forth. Coming and going through the front door. Eva kept her eyes on their faces. Hoping to spot her husband. Austin. Among the crowd. But he was nowhere to be seen. Eva glanced at her watch repeatedly. Growing increasingly anxious. She even took out her phone. Contemplating calling a cab to go home but decided against it when she noticed two girls conversing nearby. The girls sat closely, speaking in hushed tones. Eva unintentionally overheard most of their conversation. I have no idea why I need this baby. One of the girls confessed. Her gaze falling on her belly with a hint of resentment. Mason drinks but doesn't work anywhere. And I have to work from dawn till dusk at two jobs. My mother was right. I should have had an abortion. But Mason said no. The other girl listened attentively. Her face twisted with empathy. But it's a great sin. She remarked sadly. They say it makes life very hard. You can't sleep. And you can get all sorts of diseases. It's a terrible thing. The first girl smiled wryly and then turned serious gazing intently at her companion. Isn't it a sin to have a child you can't provide for? She questioned. Isn't it a terrible thing to have a salary below the minimum wage? I have a tiny dorm room and no hope for a bright future. You know. I tax all those humanists who talk about sins and suffering. Let them support people like me. The conversation between the two girls continued. But Eva couldn't catch their whispers. She stood up. Retrieved her outerwear from the coat room. And headed outside. Despite the warmth and sunshine of the day, Eva felt a darkness and coldness within her. The conversation she had overheard left her with a heavy heart. Pondering the challenges and choices people faced in their lives. Strangers made her anxious about her future. Even though Eva was confident that she and her husband, Austin, would be just fine financially, as they both worked for the same company and earned good money, she couldn't shake a feeling of gloom and alienation. It was as though she had suddenly found herself on a distant planet. Sitting in the cab, she looked longingly at the grey houses they passed, where ordinary people lived. Leading ordinary lives filled with joy, sorrow, love, suffering, and ultimately, death. Eva had never paid much attention to them before. But now she felt a newfound interest in their lives. I used to be like them. And no one cared about me either. Eva thought. Her gaze fixed on the window. When she was a child. Her greatest dream was to have a father. After her mother, Evelyn, passed away, Eva was adopted by her Aunt Meredith. 
Meredith knew nothing about Eva's father. As her sister had been secretive about her personal life. Furthermore, they lived in different cities and saw each other only a few times a year. Evelyn, who had given birth to Eva out of wedlock, had gone into substantial debt to provide for her daughter. She was never able to repay that debt and ultimately took her own life. By overdosing on sleeping pills. After her sister's funeral, Meredith adopted her orphan niece and made every effort to be the best mother she could. She succeeded in becoming the mother figure in Eva's life. Eva, as she grew older and learned to speak, began to call Meredith mother, thus rewarding her for all her love and care. As Eva reached school age, she often questioned her aunt about the absence of a man in their household. Her classmates had fathers, older brothers, uncles, and grandfathers. But Eva only had Meredith. However, men had never paid any attention to Meredith. To this, Meredith simply shrugged her shoulders and laughed it off, saying, When you grow up, you can get yourself a husband. Although, you know, I'd rather get a dog or a cat. Eva was a child at the time and didn't fully comprehend what Meredith meant. But as she grew, entered high school, and eventually attended university, she began to understand the concepts of love, affection, heartache, and separation. It all seemed quite trivial and naively childish until she met Austin her future husband. By then, Eva had graduated, secured a job as a manager at a company, and was still living with her aunt in a small apartment. She couldn't bear the thought of leaving the place either. Because of her deep attachment to Meredith or simply, because it was conveniently close to her workplace. One day, on her way home from work, Eva stopped by the amusement park walked along the boardwalk, and patted stray dogs. As she was about to leave, she noticed a young man sitting on the ground. It was late September, but he was dressed inadequately, wearing a tattered wool sweater, dirty jeans, and torn sneakers. However, something about him caught Eva's attention. It wasn't his appearance that shocked her but rather his eyes, which were fixated on the dog's hungrily devouring sausage. It appeared as though he might attempt to snatch their food away. Sensing the girl's gaze on him, he averted his attention from the dogs and tried to appear serious. He leaned back, crossed his legs, and waved playfully at Eva. Curious, she approached him, took a seat beside him, and inquired about what had happened to him. Nothing. Just relaxing. Watching the sunset. The boy said jokingly. Followed by a bout of laughter. However. A severe cough overtook him. Causing him to double over. It might be pneumonia. Eva said. You should see a doctor before it gets worse. Trying to look serious once more. The boy waved away her concern. It's all right. It happens to me sometimes. He explained. Eva nodded and noticed a box with some coins in it standing near his feet. In a futile attempt to hide it. He immediately kicked the box away with his foot. But it was too late. Eva had already seen it. Seems like you're homeless. Eva remarked. Shaking her head. So, what happened? The guy began making excuses, stating that he was fine and not actually homeless. He claimed he was seeking an adventure and wanted to experience life on the streets for a while, purely out of boredom. All right. And there's nothing to worry about. He reassured her. Before he could finish, a severe coughing fit overtook him leaving him gasping for breath. He fell to his knees, 
clutching his chest in pain, concerned. Eva rushed to his side and touched his hand. Only to recoil, the man was burning up with fever. All right. Come with me. Eva said sternly, helping the man to his feet. We need to bring down your temperature right away. Or you won't make it through the morning. She hailed a passing cab and guided the feverish man into it. Instructing the driver to hurry. Upon arriving at her home, Eva settled him into bed and insisted he take some fever-reducing medication. By the way, my name is Austin. The man said hoarsely, squinting from the brightness of the room. What's yours? Eva introduced herself. And Austin, weary from his illness, drifted off to sleep, murmuring her name several times. The following morning, Austin had made some recovery. His fever had subsided. And the coughing was less severe than the day before. Over breakfast, Austin confessed to Eva that he wasn't an adventurer, but the victim of a robbery. It turned out that he had arrived in town two weeks earlier to apply for a job. At the train station, he was met by a cab driver who offered him an unbelievably cheap ride, which Austin accepted. The cab driver took him to a desolate area outside the city, where his accomplices were waiting. They violently beat Austin, taking everything he had, including his clothes, and then left him stranded. Eva questioned why he hadn't gone to the police, to which Austin replied. Those bastards must have left the city by now. He had indeed visited the police as soon as he had recovered a bit. But by then, his attackers were long gone. They refused to accept my statement. They didn't believe me and accused me of making up tall tales. Austin looked into Eva's eyes. His face pale. And then he questioned her. Tell me. Do I look like a drunk? Eva gazed at Austin's sincere face and shook her head. I don't think so. She replied. Though I could be wrong. Austin chuckled and began to share more about his life. He spoke about his parents living in the village, his school and university years, and many other stories he had longed to share with someone. Eva quietly listened to his frank monologue while attending to her daily tasks. Austin's words kept flowing. Where are your parents? Austin suddenly asked, making Eva feel somewhat uneasy. Eva hesitated for a moment before responding. I don't have parents. I only have an aunt. She's currently out of the city. So I'll have to meet her when she returns. Austin wanted to inquire further about her parents. But he felt it might be an inappropriate question. So he refrained. Thanks to Eva's care. Austin fully recovered in a few days. Eva lent him some money to restore his identification documents and rent an apartment. She also promised to help him find a job at the company where she worked. A few days later, Eva's aunt returned and noticed the significant change in her niece during her absence. Curious. She asked what had happened. But Eva merely smiled mysteriously and kept her silence. Choosing not to disclose anything about Austin, at least until his situation improved. And their relationship became clearer. Eva didn't have to wait long. Within a month, Austin received his first paycheck and invited Eva to a restaurant, where he proposed. Their whirlwind journey continued with a wedding, moving into a new apartment, and the joyful news that Eva was pregnant. Everything was happening so quickly that Eva's head was spinning. The only constant in her life seemed to be the hospital, where she visited for regular checkups before the delivery. At the hospital, amidst other expectant mothers and busy doctors, Eva realized that the greatest happiness was yet to come. Everything else, including the rapid changes in her life, felt like a short prelude. On her way home, 
Eva hailed a cab but asked the driver to take her to the office first. She hadn't been there for nearly a month. And she missed the work environment and her colleagues. Additionally, she wanted to see their reactions to her return. Hear their congratulations. And bask in the attention. Eva had never been particularly ambitious. Nor did she seek the limelight. But her pregnancy had somehow stirred a desire to be at the center of attention. However, when she arrived at the office, she was surprised to find the lobby empty. She inquired with the security guard at the front desk about the absence of her colleagues. It's a short day. The guard explained, not taking his eyes off the TV. Tomorrow is some holiday. Realizing she wouldn't obtain more information from the guard, Eva informed him that she needed to retrieve some personal belongings and made her way up to the second floor. The stairs and corridors were unusually quiet and dim. As if the entire building had been abandoned, Eva hesitated when she approached the door of her office, contemplating whether she wanted to enter. It suddenly struck her that she didn't have her keys, and she chuckled at her own forgetfulness. She was about to turn and leave, when her attention was captured by the sound of moans. Eva walked cautiously, attempting not to make any noise, towards the source of the moans. They were emanating from the CEO's office. Eva approached and listened. But the office was empty. However, a man's voice resonated within. The voice sounded eerily familiar to her, making her heart race with disbelief. Austin. She whispered, unable to believe it. No. It can't be. Eva knocked on the door and tentatively turned the doorknob. Stepping inside, she was met with a scene that seemed like a far-fetched, theatrical production that couldn't possibly be real. In this drama, there were just two characters, her husband, Austin, and the CEO's daughter, Stacy. They were both only half-dressed and froze in shock when they saw Eva enter, awkwardly covering themselves with whatever they could find. Austin. Eva gasped, her eyes darting between her husband and Stacy. What's going on here? Austin, still in the process of dressing himself, extended his hand toward his wife and stammered. I can explain everything. It's not what you think. Stacy, still only partially clothed, was mortified and begged Eva. Wait, please. Don't look at me like that. But Eva kept staring at her husband with eyes filled with shock and remained silent. Then, she vented her frustration by slamming her fist onto the CEO's desk. Her voice quivered as she questioned him. How could you do this to me? And when did this affair begin? Was it when I was in the hospital? Or even earlier? Austin rushed toward his wife. But his intentions changed when he felt her fury. He received a slap across his face that stung like a branding iron. Curse you. Austin. Eva hissed. Turning her back to him. I'll never forgive you for this. With that. Eva quickly exited the office. Making her way downstairs and out of the building. Leaving the security guard baffled by her sudden departure. Liquid nitrogen seemed to flow through Eva's chest. She had never experienced such an icy, dead sensation before. The world around her transformed. The gray houses seemed even grayer. The birds were silent. And people passing by blurred into dark. Indistinct figures. These phantom-like figures pursued her relentlessly all the way back home. She burst into the apartment fell to her knees, and wept. Meredith, her aunt, immediately grasped the gravity of the situation, and silently settled on the floor beside Eva. They sat there for a long time. Eva couldn't find solace, resentment, hatred, 
and confusion gnawed at her from within. Suddenly, an excruciating pain pierced her lower abdomen like a knife. She collapsed on her back, clutching her stomach and wailing in agony. The sharp pain was relentless. And Eva was on the verge of losing consciousness. Recognizing that her niece was going into labor, Meredith rushed to call an ambulance. When she returned, Eva had already lost consciousness. Eva couldn't recall the details of the childbirth process. It was all a hazy blur. When the baby was born, the room seemed to spin, and she felt as though her entire world had been turned upside down. When the girl came to her senses, the nurse informed her that she had given birth to a boy, and asked if she wanted to see him. Eva shook her head in the negative and pulled the blanket over herself. What? You had such a difficult labor. And you don't even want to look at the baby? The nurse exclaimed in astonishment. Eva raised her head, glaring at the nurse, prompting her to fall silent. She instructed the nurse to bring her son and leave her alone. The nurse returned with her baby, then left the ward. Eva cradled the infant in her arms and began to weep. Gazing at the tiny, vulnerable human being who reached out his arms toward her. It reminded her of a recent conversation. She had overheard between two girls discussing challenging destinies. Now, she found herself in a similar predicament. Eva was without a husband now. And she had severed all connections with her ex-husband. She decided to leave her job a week after returning from the hospital. A few months later, her high school friend, Jessica, extended an invitation for Eva to work at a fish processing plant in the northern part of the country. Jessica had been employed there for nearly three years and had met her husband through the job. Perhaps you'll find someone there too. Jessica gently suggested upon hearing Eva's circumstances. There are plenty of great men in the north of the country, healthy and strong. Unlike the guys down here. Love affairs were the furthest thing from Eva's mind. She was solely focused on ensuring her son would. Have a good upbringing and providing for her Aunt Meredith's comfortable retirement. Eva promptly accepted the job offer. Even though she was aware of the arduous nature of the work. The salary, which was three times higher than her previous earnings, made it a compelling choice. After packing her bags and entrusting her son, Alex, to her aunt's care, Eva embarked on her journey to the north. She worked diligently, nurturing dreams of a brighter future while trying to bury her past. However, the past resurfaced in her life like an unexpected storm. One day, Meredith called with unsettling news, Eva's ex-husband, Austin, had been incarcerated, confused and shocked. Eva asked for details. Her aunt had only heard rumors and was somewhat hesitant to share the information. They say he accepted a high-ranking position at the company. Meredith finally revealed. Even the CEO. I believe. He appeared to have succeeded. But it seems that karma has a way of catching up with everyone. Austin has been accused of economic crimes. And sentenced to seven years in prison. They say the company no longer even exists. Everyone has gone into hiding. The news hit Eva hard. She couldn't help but picture Austin behind bars. And the weight of it left her feeling unwell. She certainly hadn't expected this turn of events. I don't care about that, it's over between us. Eva replied. She applied an irritated tone. Making it clear that she had no interest in Austin's situation. Meredith mumbled into the phone that she had merely. Wanted to share the news with her daughter. However. Eva had stopped listening. She pocketed the phone and gazed up at the cloudless northern sky. A peculiar and unexpected thought crossed her mind, maybe somewhere far away, on the other side of the country. 
Austin was also looking at the sky and thinking of her. She pushed the thought aside. Focusing back on her work. Picking up a fallen mop. The thought of her ex-husband dissipated as swiftly as it had appeared. Seven years passed. And Austin's prison sentence concluded. He walked out of the prison gates. A free man. Accompanied by a prison guard. Taking in a deep breath of the December air. He turned to the guard and said his farewells. Raising his hands in the air. Free. I'm a free man now. He shouted at the top of his voice. Then turned and briskly walked away. Never looking back. Austin spent the bus journey sleeping and only stirred. When the old bus came to a creaking stop. The city had changed significantly after all these years. Sitting at a cafe table. Hungrily devouring grilled chicken. Austin contemplated his next steps. He had nowhere to go, his parents had passed away two years earlier. Leaving him with no family home to return to. Their house was likely in disrepair by now. Searching for a job in the city seemed futile. As Austin was aware that no one would likely hire an employee. With a history of economic crime. Lost in his gloomy thoughts. He almost forgot about the chicken until. A little hand stealthily reached out for it. Austin caught the child's hand and stared directly into the thief's eyes. The boy immediately pleaded. Mister. Let me go. I won't do it again. His eyes teary and his nose sniffled. Reluctantly, Austin released his grip on the child, and the boy made a hasty escape. However, in his rush, he tripped over a table leg, dropping several plates and angering the cafe owner, who threatened to reprimand the child severely. Austin intervened, preventing the owner from taking harsh action, and paid for the damage. He invited the boy to join him at his table and handed him a plate of chicken. The young boy eagerly devoured the meal, leaving no trace of food on the plate. Austin asked the child when he had last eaten, and the boy held up his hand, bending three greasy fingers to indicate his hunger, and showed them to Austin. Three days ago, he said quietly. Austin asked the waiter to bring more food and began to inquire about the boy's life. My name is Alex. He introduced himself. I live with my mother. My grandmother used to live with us. But she died recently. My mom got sick. And she's better than now. I'm afraid she'll die too. Just like grandma. The boy was distracted as the waiter placed. A bowl of hot soup in front of him. Alex clutched the spoon in his fist and began to eat quickly. Austin reminded him. Don't eat so fast. Chew better. Then he continued. You know. Today is a very important day for me. I got out of prison today. Alex looked at him. Frightened. And asked. What's prison? Austin was taken aback by the question. Not knowing what to say. He responded briefly. Prison is a bad place to be. It would be better if you never knew what it is. The boy shared. My dad is in prison too. I've been waiting for him for a long time. But he's still not here. Mom says he's a fool for getting in there. Austin chuckled. Took money from his pocket. Counted out some banknotes and placed them on the table. This is for you. Alex. He said, handing a couple of banknotes to the boy. Buy medicines for your mom. What's your mother's name? The boy thanked Austin and rushed to the exit. Revealing that his mother's name was Eva Harris. Austin followed the boy. Catching up with him at the exit. He told Alex. You won't believe this. While squatting down. I happen to know your mom. We used to work together. I'm her friend. You know. 
I need to see her. Will you take me to her? Alex hesitated for a moment but eventually agreed to lead Austin to his mother. Austin followed the boy. A whirlwind of thoughts in his head. And a pain in his chest. They arrived at a shabby three-story dormitory. Formerly a college building. Which now housed various low-income residents orphans. People with disabilities. And retirees. Austin struggled to open the jammed door. Let Alex go first. And entered the building. Which had a damp and musty smell. Alex explained. This is where we live. Mom said we used to have our own big apartment. She and Grandma sold it and moved here because we needed some money. The boy finished his story as he led the way up to their apartment door. Austin followed the boy into the room. Which was quite small. Reminiscent of his prison cell. An old bed stood by the window next to the radiator. Where Eva. His ex-wife. Lay covered by a blanket. Another bed. Seemingly Alex's. Stood against the other wall. A small coffee table with empty medicine bottles and. Some books completed the meager interior. Mom. Your friend is here to see you. Alex announced. Alex. Stroking his mother's hand. Shared with her. He gave me some money. Look. The boy took money from his pocket and placed it on the table. He then sat down on the bed and waited to see what would happen next. Eva. With sleepy eyes. Looked at Austin. Who stood before her and asked. What are you doing here? She whispered. Pressing her back against the radiator. How did you find me? Austin pointed to Alex and then requested him. To play in the hallway with a toy car. Once they were alone in the room. Austin sat down on the floor and remained silent for a long time. You know. Eva. He began. His eyes full of tears. When I was in prison. I used to think about how bad it was. I also thought about betrayal and how I got set up at the company. It was Stacy and her father who set me up. But it was fair karma. The boomerang got me. I got what I deserved for my meanness. I wanted to go home. To be free. I wanted to start a new life. I dreamed that when I got out of prison. Everything would be the same as before. Or even better. But today. I met Alex. My son. Poor and hungry. Suddenly. I wanted to go back to prison. Bastards like me don't deserve to be here. I don't deserve to be anywhere. Not even in hell. Eva responded with a hoarse voice. You say terrible things. I feel sorry for Alex. Who can take care of him? Meredith is gone. There's no one left to take care of him. I'm the only one left. And I'll die soon. Don't be ridiculous. Austin muttered. You're still very young. It's not your time to die. But you sound like an old woman. He looked at Eva. Who began to cry. Unable to contain her emotions any longer. I was wondering if you had forgotten me or not. Said Austin. Covering his face with his hands. It was important for me to know. Sometimes I go out into the yard. Look up at the sky. And think about you. Who else could I be thinking of? You saved my life. And this is how I repaid you for your kindness. Eva. Between her sobs. Managed to say. I forgave you long ago. Austin covered her with a blanket and then called Alex. Who was playing outside the door. He brought the boy inside and sat him down in his lap. Listen. Alex. He said seriously. Looking into the boy's green eyes. Which were as green as his own. I'm your father. Alex looked at Austin incredulously and then glanced at his mother. Dad. He asked again. 
with a hint of disbelief. Austin and Eva nodded simultaneously, trying to convince their incredulous son. Yeah. Hey. Alex. He suddenly squealed, jumping to the floor. Dad's back. Now I have a daddy. He galloped around the room like a little lamb. And Austin and Eva watched him, cuddling and not knowing whether they should laugh or cry. At the end of the month, after getting Eva back on her feet, Austin moved her and Alex to his parents' house in the village. The house really needed some repairs. So he decided to renovate it the next spring. In the meantime, there were other things to worry about. He needed to get a job and enroll Alex in school. His neighbor, Jonathan, helped Austin find a job. He offered him a position as a maintenance worker in his sawmill and promised a good salary. Austin immediately accepted the offer. Jonathan gave him half of his salary in advance and provided him with building materials to repair the front of the house. This is for you to fix the porch gate, wicket, and maybe spruce up the front of the house a little bit. I'll bring more in the spring. Jonathan explained as he helped Austin unload the building materials into the yard. Austin thanked him, and Jonathan left. As Austin looked around the yard, he called out to Alex, who was playing outside. Well, Alex, Christmas is coming. He said as he sat his son on his lap. We need a Christmas tree. Alex's eyes sparkled, and he clapped his hands happily. Christmas tree. Christmas tree. Hooray. Are we going to go into the woods and chop down a Christmas tree? He shouted. Austin laughed. Shook his head. And said. No. Son. We'll go to the market and buy a Christmas tree there. Call your mom. Let's go right now. Alex called his mother. And they came out of the crooked gate together walking down the street, smiling and laughing.